Welcome. We're going to talk about a rather large but very important topic of basic heart muscle disease or cardiomyopathy. We're going to do an overview and then we will talk pretty much in three little bins or three larger bins about the various forms of cardiomyopathy. While we are understanding more and more of the genetic basis underlying many of these intrinsic heart muscle diseases, it's still best to think about them in terms of their pathophysiology. So we will talk about a dilated or globoid or kind of floppy heart. We'll talk about a very hyperdynamic heart, that's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then we will talk about restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is a stiff heart. So let's start with a cardiomyopathy overview. As I've already stated, cardiomyopathies are basically a group of diseases that affect the heart muscle and decrease its ability to pump blood. And that may be because it doesn't fill very well or because it doesn't pump very well. And either one of those will lead to the overall effect that there is diminished ability to pump blood systemically to all the organs of the body. There can be primary causes of cardiomyopathy intrinsic to the cardiac muscle. There may be secondary forms due to diseases of other kinds that affect the cardiac muscle. We're going to use this kind of uh, schematic to help understand the various forms of cardiomyopathy, or the types. Looking at the normal heart, you can see then we've emphasized mainly the left ventricle and the left atrium and the aorta, but you can also, in some of the images that we're going to show, affect the right ventricle as well. But the normal heart has normal closure of valves, normal size left atrial, normal size left ventricle cavity, normal thickness of the myocardium in the left ventricle. In a dilated cardiomyopathy, we're going to see kind of a globoid dilation of the heart. This is actually the most common cause of cardiomyopathy. Roughly 85 to 90 percent of cases are going to be dilated cardiomyopathy. And along with this dilation of the chamber, you can see that we're pulling those papillary muscles a little bit apart, which are tugging on the chordae tendineae, which are opening the mitral valve, and so there's marked left atrial dilation. Those are all part and parcel of a dilated cardiomyopathy. This also includes arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, previously called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy because it predominantly affects the right ventricle. The important point about this is that it is a form of dilated cardiomyopathy. We'll cover it more later, so just keep that in mind. The flip side of the coin is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a thickened ventricle with a hyperdynamic heart. So there's more cardiac muscle mass. The outcome, though, however, because of obstruction to the left ventricular outflow due to the thickness of the interventricular septum myocardium can also lead to left atrial enlargement. So you can have some of the same general geographic effects. And then there's restrictive cardiomyopathy, where the chambers of the heart look pretty normal, the thickness of the wall looks pretty normal. But because we have infiltrated the myocytes, or the, the myocardium, with various things like fibrous connective tissue or amyloid, the walls are stiff. So they don't relax very well. Okay, we're going to cover each of these in turn, these kind of basic pathophysiologic forms, dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive, and talk about the etiologies and the consequences. Let's start first with dilated cardiomyopathy. In general, it's split about 50-50. Uh, the, the numbers change because we're finding more genetic causes, but roughly 50-50 genetic causes and non-genetic causes. These dilated cardiomyopathies cause systolic dysfunction. So they don't squeeze very well. They actually fill pretty well. They're pretty floppy, so they, they fill okay. They just don't squeeze the blood out. So ejection fractions will be markedly diminished. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we know it's about 100% of cases have a genetic cause, and we understand the vast majority of those. In this case, it's not systolic dysfunction. They squeeze great. In fact, they squeeze too well, but they don't relax very well. So they're like hard driving medical students around the world. They work really hard and they don't relax very well. So it's diastolic dysfunction. And then in restrictive cardiomyopathy, 
as I've already stated, it's associated with some systemic disorders, or it may be idiopathic. And the fundamental problem is that it's diastolic dysfunction. It's a stiff heart. There's not a lot of muscle there, or not excessive increases in muscle, but it's stiff, and therefore you have diastolic dysfunction. It doesn't relax to fill very well. In all of the cases, whether it's dilated, hypertrophic, or restrictive, the clinical presentations are pretty much the same. It's heart failure. We have inadequate pump function to perfuse the rest of the body. And as the heart either dilates and the valves fail, or as we have increased squeezing with poor relaxation, we, don't, we tend to get regurgitant flow into the atrium, we get left atrial enlargement that leads to atrial fibrillation. A combination of atrial fibrillation, a kind of quivering left atrium, and diminished flow through that left atrium with a dilated left atrium is going to make that portion of the heart prone to forming thrombi. So patients can also present with stroke. And with sudden cardiac death, due to either embolization or to sudden arrhythmic events. So the final consequences of all of these are pretty much the same. How we get there in each of them is a little bit different. All right, that's the overview. And if you've got that, then you've really understood about 80% of what we're gonna be talking about. The next 20% are gonna be details that are important for you to take care of patients and also to ace those board examinations. Let's start with dilated cardiomyopathy. We are looking at the, the, the schematic that we've used many, many times to show the various chambers of the heart. We have the right-sided heart, all in blue, the inferior and superior vena cava to the right atrium, to the tricuspid valve, to the right ventricle, pulmonic valve going out to the lungs, and then returning in pink to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins, across the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, and out the aorta. Okay. In dilated cardiomyopathy, we get a progressive cardiac dilation for a variety of causes that we'll talk about. It's associated not only with that dilation, but because we are stretching the cardiac myocytes, we are actually causing a rearrangement of the gap junctions that connect between the myocytes. So there's electrical and mechanical dysfunction. And overall, there's impaired systolic function. It just doesn't squeeze very well. It is the most common cardiomyopathy, causing about 90% of cases of cardiomyopathy not otherwise specified. Most commonly diagnosed in 20s to 50s, somewhere in that ballpark, but in fact, you can have it much younger, as we'll talk about. You can have it much later, as we'll talk about. It is a lethal disease. One half of patients, 50%, will be dead within a couple years if not successfully treated, and only 25%, a quarter, will survive longer than five years. So this is as bad as or worse than many malignancies in terms of mortality. Again, it's 50-50 roughly for the, the causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. We'll, call, we'll cover first the non-genetic causes. So it, it turns out that infections, in particular myocarditis, will cause damage to the cardiac myocytes, and then over a period of time, you may develop a dilated cardiomyopathy. You may not even have recognized the original infection of the heart muscle, but the consequences that we can see downstream will nevertheless chronically progress. Toxic exposures, and this can be a variety of chemotherapy agents, this can be heavy metals, this can be alcohol in alcohol uh, use disorders. So all of those can cause it. A relatively, unfortunately, rare cause, non-genetic cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is pregnancy. So postpartum or peripartum cardiomyopathy. And we'll talk a little bit about those mechanisms. Ischemia. So ischemic heart disease is probably one of the greater non-genetic causes. And low levels of Ischemia, not necessarily even frank infarction, but low levels of ischemia can lead over time to progressive dysfunction with a dilated heart. You can have something called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. This is uh, the so-called broken heart syndrome due to stress. 
And what do we mean by stress? We mean actually elevated catechols, which cause microvascular spasm. Microvascular spasm that lasts for greater than 20 to 30 minutes will cause microvascular infarct. And then you get an ischemic cardiomyopathy. So you can have stress cardiomyopathy or Takotsubo. Tachycardia. So just having a very rapid heart rate for prolonged periods of time can also cause dilated cardiomyopathy. And the reason for that is it's, it's part of high output failure. Uh, it is actually a mechanism by which we can induce heart failure in experimental animals, just pace them very quickly. And it is because over a period of time, we've talked previously, the normal cardiac cycle, roughly a, th a third of a second is going to be for systole and two thirds of a second for diastole. And if you have 60 beats per minute, that's kind of the, the sequence. But now if I increase heart rate significantly, 120, 180 beats per minute, the systole stays the same, but the diastole shortens. And remember, we only perfuse the heart during diastole. So chronic tachycardia, chronic high output will actually drive a dilated cardiomyopathy due to an ischemia. Iron overload, diseases like hemochromatosis, um, either whether it's primary or secondary, will also cause a dilated cardiomyopathy. We'll talk about mechanisms shortly. Let's look at the genetic causes. Most of these are defects in a variety of proteins involved in the contractile apparatus of the sarcomeres. And I will say, as we're getting more and more sophisticated, smarter and smarter, and looking at more genes, we are finding increasing genetic causes of dilated cardiomyopathy, things that had previously been called idiopathic. As I say, majority of these seem to be defects in forced generation. So the way that the actin and myosin fibers interact with each other or are regulated by troponin or tropomyosin, we don't get effective sarcomeric contraction. But some of the genetic causes involve signal defects, that we're not getting the appropriate movement, say, of ions within the myocytes, or it may even be defective ATP generation. Regardless of the cause, genetic or non-genetic, in dilated cardiomyopathy, again, we, over ha we ha overall have decreased myocardial contractility. And the phenotype for all of these, regardless, includes dilation of the cardiac chambers. That's how we get the name, dilated cardiomyopathy. There is myocyte hypertrophy. So in, as we are getting less and less contractile, the response, the adaptation of the heart is to say, well, we, we need to have stronger myocytes. So even as we're getting less contractile force, the myocytes are undergoing hypertrophy. So they will be enlarged. The abnormal, Volume and pressure will lead to the myofibroblasts, the fibroblasts within the heart, to lay down increased fibrosis. That's going to also materially affect the contractility of the heart. And because we have these dilated chambers with diminished movement of blood through them, they're going to be prone to developing thrombi, which can eventually embolize.